Hi, welcome back to our subunit related to Greek art. Um, in this video, we're going to be looking at um, some more architecture and some later Greek sculpture. Um, we finished um, talking about the Parthenon last time. We talked about the actual architecture as well as the decorative program um, that was under Phidias. Um, now we're going to be looking at another temple. This is another temple devoted to Athena, um, the temple of Athena Nike. Um, and um, Athena was honored as the goddess of victory um, in this very small temple of Athena Nike um, that crowns the southern edge of the Acropolis. Um, it has a square naos um, and a front and back porch. Um, with four ionic columns and four steps. So it's a little bit different um, than our typical Doric um, temple. Remember the Doric temple had, uh, you know, the, the capitals that were a little bit thicker and more like a, a pancake shape um, capital. Um, now we have the, the Doric order and this has that very decorative scroll. Um, also with the Doric order, the columns are a bit sleeker. Um, and here we have these kind of steps as opposed to that are leading up to um, the other features um, in, in, in the stylobite where the columns go into. And so this is a very tiny temple. So you can see sort of this was where the square ne um, naos or cella inside would be. And then you have these two porches on either side for balance. Um, <laughs> Let's see. This repetition um, reflects the classical insistence on unifying the parts within the whole. Um, the small size and graceful ionic order of the Nike temple contrasts with the heavier proportions of the Doric columns in the Parthenon. Um, this is also called an M5 um, Pro style temple. Um, so the colonnades located are just located on the front and back of the structure instead of all the way around. So here's a diagram. So this is an M5 um, Pro style temple. Um, this is these are perpetual style temples that we looked at, where we had um, the colonnade going all the way around the structure. Um, around the building was a par um, a parapet. Um, this is a law a low wall. Um, decorated with exquisite reliefs um, and most of them were of um, they were a dozen um, there were a dozen images um, devoted to this idea and theme of victory um, and they depicted these goddesses or angel-like figure figures who personified victory and they were also known as the winged goddess of victory and these are called um, Nike N-I-K-E um, and those adorned the pair, um, the parapet. And we'll look at an example. So this is one of those figures. So a Nike is, it does look very much like an, it is an angel. Um, and, and really what happens is that Christian, you know, Christian culture really looks to the Greeks and really does take a lot of um, Greek iconography and, and sort of absorbs it and sort of um, rebrands it um, with Christian ideas. Um, also Nike, if you think of the company Nike shoes, they used to have a little winged um, logo and that's where that comes from, the Nike, which was a winged victory. Um, um, so... So this is referred to as Nike adjusting her sandal, and this is located from the south side of the parapet of the Temple of Athena of Nike, that's located in the Acropolis. And this is probably the best example of relief, relief sculpture from the Nike Temple. Um, it's originally It was originally located on a bow, balustrade. Again, this is another kind, this is the same word for a parapet wall, a kind of low wall that is placed at the side of the staircase, bridges, etc. Um, and that it made, uh, and that it, it is made of a row of short um, posts um, topped with a long rail um, of the parapet. Um, and you really, I mean, we'll, we'll go over those architectural features. 
Um, this figure combines um, a graceful curved torso with um, diagonal planes in her legs. So this is an example of, you know, sort of classical, you know, high classical sculpture. We see the sheer, almost transparent drapery. Again, this idea of wet drapery that is very revealing and shows more about the body than if the body were depicted nude. Um, it, you know, it's referred to as wet, wet drapery because it appears um, to cling to the body. And it does fall in, in this pattern of elegant repeated folds. Um, behind the Nike is a remnant of an open wing. Um, its smooth surface contrasts with a very activated um, drapery. Um, and at the same time echoes the frames of the torso's curves. So there is this sort of balance where you have the sort of this curve of the torso here where she's bending or slightly bending to adjust her sandal. And then you have this nice arc and curve of her wings over here. And I know I'm cutting off part of the picture. I apologize. Um, amazingly, um, perceptual depiction, um, this is done in the um, Phidian, so Phidias was the in charge of the decorative program of the Parthenon, and so he he's known to have this. Um, now there's a style called Phidian style, and this wet drapery in particular is associated with that style. Um, and um, and there's also a sense of gravity. You know, the drapery does seem sort of heavy and wet, and and so we do get that sense of it, sort of that idea of weight and gravity. Um, and then the Nike is taking off her shoe because she is on holy ground. Um, so that's the reasoning behind um, her action. One wing open, one wing closed to help keep her balance. <laughs> so there is this idea of balance. And it's cool, you know, sort of applying these ideas of, of how, you know, heavenly um, people and objects would act in the real world. So she's sort of, you know, trying to steady herself by having one winged closed and one opened. Um, and really what's beautiful about this is piece is that they, they've taken, the artist has taken a very awkward movement um, and has made it very graceful and elegant. And so there is this idea of sumatria, a balance of imbalances, again, which is a very classical innovation and then becomes a convention of classical, high classical art, Greek art and sculpture. Right. Um, and I, I think I talked, I talked about the Acropolis. Um, I'm going to talk, go back and talk about the Athena Agora. Um, and this was a public area. This was a marketplace and civic centers. It was one of the most important parts of the ancient city of Athens. In addition to being a place where people gathered to buy and sell all kinds of commodities, it was also a place where people assembled to discuss all kinds of topics, business, politics, current events, um, or the nature of the universe and the divine. The Agora of Athens um, where ancient, is where ancient Greek democracy first came to life, providing a wonderful opportunity to examine the commercial, political, religious, and cultural life of one of the great cities of the ancient world. And so you do have to know the sort of the floor plan or the, the city plan of the Agora. And in, in a sense, it's, it's different because this is more public, um, a public space as opposed to a sacred space even though there is, you know, some sacred, what I would consider sacred, you know, um, temples and stuff located on top of the hill. And so here is just kind of listing all the different um, famous sort of arc, you know, buildings and temples. The, you know, here's the, the Parthenon. Here's that Pantheatic Way. So this is where the Pantheatic, um, Pan-Athenaic um, procession would have occurred and they would have um, sort of made their way up um, to the Parthenon. Um, and, you know, we can't talk about all these different structures, but there are many beautiful, um, very highly innovative um, architecture that we just touch the base of um, in, our, in our studies of Greek art. And so this is the, the plan, the city plan. Um, and again, on the AP exam, you do have to know the plans, um, the, the city plans. And so this is probably what they would show you. Obviously, it wouldn't have the word Agora on there, but um, just so you um, sort of understand that sort of diagram of the Agora. 
All right, we're going to be looking at another form of architecture, um, sculpture, relief sculpture, um, in the form of steles. Um, and again, a stele was an upright stone slab, um, and this was used in Greek um, cemeteries as grave markers, usually carved in low relief with an image. Um, the image was actually allegorical of the person to be remembered. Um, so we shift from this proud warrior athlete during the archaic period, and it's been, rec you know, it's been replaced by the stele with a sort of classical figure. Um, and usually it depicts sort of a personal um, or domestic um, context um, that often features women and children in the sort of domestic interior setting. So this is the grave stele of Hegazo. This is the one you're responsible for. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this one of the little girl. Um, this is one of the finest grave stele of the classical period in an exquisite example of the so-called rich style. It is um, shaped like a small temple. Um, you see this um, crown, you know, it almost seems like it's crowned by a pediment feature here at the top. Um, and um, it's shaped like a small temple. Um, the horizontal cornice bears the name of the deceased, um, Hegeso, daughter of Proxenus. Um, the Athenian lady is depicted sitting on an elegant chair, her feet resting on a footstool. She wears um, a chilton, which is a type of um, dress, um, and a hemation, and I'm, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. This is a transparent headdress that, they, that Greek women would wear. Um, she picks a jewel, which was probably painted on the stele from the open um, pyrex, um, Pyxis, uh, or a jewelry box, which her young servant standing opposite extends towards her. The slave wears the long-sleeved um, barbarian dress and a snood on her head. Um, traces of blue color are visible on the background. Um, the sadness on the woman's face has a remarkable impact, and so the mood of this piece does have a very melancholy feel, and it seems to dominate the scene um, with, a, with a softness and delicacy. Um, and we see that indicated in both the flesh and the fabric of the figures. Um, and again, this is very much characteristic of the classical period. Um, the stele was probably executed by a skilled artist, probably um, Kalamachos. And I'm sorry, I, I keep forgetting to talk about the names of artists. So going back to the, t the temple, Callicrates was the architect or of the Temple of Athena Nike. So just to make sure we're getting that. The top left corner, I just wanted to show this, this one to you because I love it, um, features a touching scene of a girl um, um, seemingly to sort of bid farewell to her pet bird that she kisses on her beak. Um, she wears a loose peplos, which, is, um, which parts at the side to showcase the mottled flesh underneath her body and clings elsewhere all over to emphasize the figure in three-dimensional form. So again, very much a, a, an extraordinary classical example. And so this is how they would have looked. So they, you know, it, it is very reminiscent of, of uh, what, you know, of a cemetery that we see today. All right. Now we're going to get into the late classical period. So I, I, I misinformed you. There's the early high, and then there's a the late classical period. Um, and I do think it's important to talk about. You don't have, you don't really have any works that you have to specifically know, um, except for the mosaic that we're going to look at. Um, but this is sort of the transition period between the classical and um, the Hellenistic period that we're going to be looking at. So the late classical is from 400 to 323 BCE. Um, and what's interesting about this period is we start to see finally the first um, female nude. Um, this is Praxilides um, Aphrodite of um, Nidos. Um, this is a Roman marble copy. Um, and um, I feel like I missed. So 
what he's done essentially is, um, you know, he's taken the, the female nude form. Um, his subject is supposedly a goddess, Aphrodite, um, but there was a lot of scandal um, about this because it really looks like a, a normal mortal woman, and he, he's, he is said to have used his lover um, as the model for this. Um, and so, you know, here it seems like a, you know, it's Aphrodite, but she's, it's a, it seems to be sort of a normal Greek woman taking a bath. You know, she has this, you know, this cloth and this cistern for water. Um, and so people really um, were, it was very controversial and very edgy um, for the time. So it was considered a very bold step to render a goddess in the nude. Um, and, and really to portray her with these very sensuous, um, sensuous and sort of humanizing qualities. Um, so this is very different um, from sort of the cold, aloof gods and athletes from the high classical period. Um, so we'll look at some other examples. This is another example, Lysippi, Lysippius. Um, this is... Um, Apoxaminos or scraper. Um, so here with the late classical period, a new canon of proportions developed by the sculptor Lysippus um, emerged from the emerged for the male figure. Um, now eight heads taller instead of seven, with a smaller head compared to Polyclitus's the spear bearer. The calm, noble, detached um, mint that had previously characterized classical classical sculpture gave way to more emotional expression. Um, and also, too, we see that he's really, the space is becoming a little bit more dynamic where he's actually, you know, he's scraping. He's scraping. This is what athletes would do. They would clean themselves. They would um, rub oil on their body and take a scraper and kind of scrape off all the oil and dirt. And his hand sort of extends into our space, which is a bit more dramatic than some of the earlier um, and high classical sculpture that we were looking at. So I just wanted to show you those two examples. Um, this is the head of Alexander. Um, he's going to be a really important figure um, in Greek history. Um, so this is an important um, mosaic piece that um, you guys do have to know for the 250 lists, um, the 250 works um, that you have to know for the AP list. Um, so this is referred to as the Alexander Mosaic. It is one of the unquestionable masterpieces of ancient Greek art. It's known by a copy found in the House of Fawn in Pompeii. This was a villa in Pompeii in, in Rome. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about villas when we get to the Roman period. Um, so this is a mosaic that was supposedly based on a Greek painting. The strength of the work and the sense of movement caused by the foreshortening of the horses and the diagonal spears is very extraordinary. Um, so this is something, um, you know, very innovative and dynamic, um, in, in, at least with Greek painting. One of the most celebrated ancient mosaics to have survived in this modern era, it is depicting pre pre precisely the ultimate movement of the victory of Alexander the Great. Fearlessly, he has fought ahead of his um, cavalry away towards the center of the Persian army um, for an eye-to-eye -eye confrontation with the Persian king Darius III, the later defeated, um, and who is later defeated and shocked. Um, and you can almost see that he's on the verge of fleeing um, his chariot. And we'll do a sort of a compare and contrast of the two rulers in a second. The mosaic was copied from an earlier original painting by um, Philox, um, Philoxens around 300 BCE. In its entirety, the mosaic measures um, about 5.82 times 3.13 meters and is made of over half a million tesserae. And tesserae um, are small um, mosaic tiles. The mosaic design contains over 1.5 million tesserae. Um, none larger than four um, millimeters. Um, it's depicted in four colors, white, yellow, red, and black. Um, the, the, min the minuteness of the tesserae enables incredibly fine detail um, and painterly effects to be achieved, um, including the remarkable portraits of Alexander 
and Darius. Um, it was discovered in the largest house in Pompeii, the House of the Fawn, in a room overlooking the central Persian, the central peristyle garden of the house. It is thought that this house was built shortly after the Roman conquest of Pompeii, and it is likely to have been the residence of one of Pompeii's um, Roman um, ruling class. Um, the mosaic highlights the wealth and power um, of the occupier of the house. Um, the border of this huge mosaic consists of larger stones in a um, donate pattern. In the corners are rosettes. So here's the sort of um, donate pattern and then these little rosettes in the corner. Within the border along the bottom of the picture is a blank brown strip which some consider to be part of the picture balancing the white expanse of sky at the top while others argue that it's um, a simple part of the frame. Um, the reason why I wanted to show you this picture of the head of Alexander is because there were lots of sculptures of Alexander and, and images done of him, and he was very distinct looking. He had this um, hairstyle and this very um, unique cowlick. And so when you look at this portrait of um, Alexander the Great, and then we look closely, I think you see a resemblance here. He's got that sort of distinct um, cowlick, um, and you can see here you know, how determined he is um, in terms of um, his um, leadership ability. And here's another image of Alexander the Great. So we're starting to see um, ideas of, you know, recognizable people. With the high classical sculpture, you know, they, they were idealized figures. They weren't really of anybody in particular. Um, but with this sort of late classical period, um, this idea of identity and, and, you know, someone being specific and with recognizable distinct fe features is something innovative that's occurring. I thought I had more images. I'm sorry. Um, you know, and, it, and most of this has been lost. Um, but we'll see um, this particular mosaic or this particular... Um, subject um, referenced in later works of art, you know, um, and so you, you will see it again. So, um, this is a sort of altar. Um, it's a reconstructed altar of, it's the altar of Zeus at Pergamon. Um, Pergamon became a breakaway state from Greece and became a leading center of the arts um, and experimental sculpture design that um, had a far-reaching influence. Um, this was a sculptural frieze that wrapped around the base of a great altar located on the mountainside at Pergamon. The altar has been um, reconstructed inside the museum um, located in Berlin. The structure is seven feet high and depicts the mythological battle between the gods and the giants. This mythological struggle was seen by Greeks as a metaphor for their own conflicts with outsiders. It is U-shaped with an enormous stairwell. The relief sculpture is carved so deeply, some of the figures almost look like sculpture in the round, and we'll take a closer look. The ferocious battle depicted, um, you know, we see very, this use of, expressive use of diagonals to convey emotion and energy. Um, the figures seem as if they're spilling out into our space, breaking their architectural boundaries. So we'll take it some, some look. So here from this view, like if you were to walk up the stairs, I mean, it really does seem like these figures are sort of spilling out into our, into our reality. Um, and here is one of the, the main relief carvings. This is a depiction of Athena um, battling Alcyonus. And again, I'm not probably pronouncing that correctly. Um, so this is a detail of Athena attacking the giants. Notice the deep set eyes and strong use of the diagonal in her body. Um, and and it really, I think you should go back and sort of contrast this image with some of the earlier classical sculptures that exhibit um, a more sense, more of a sense of balance and restraint um, compared to this sculpture. Um, the exaggerated high relief carving emphasizes a dramatic contrast of light and shade playing over the complex forms. Unlike the restraint noble expression of classical figures, um, the Helen's 
the Hellenistic faces exhibit expressions of pain, stress, anger, fear, and despair. Um, and this idea is that viewers um, can empathize. So I think I must have gotten my slides out of order. So yeah, this is Hellenistic. I must have taken out the, the, the slide. So with this, with the Zeus, um, the Pergamon, the, the Pergamon sculptors, um, and this altar of Zeus, this is Hellenistic. And we talked about this in class when we were looking at the seated boxer. You know, the sort of exaggerated diagonals movement, um, you know, this anguish in their face, and that's a characteristic that we see with um, Hellenistic, the Hellenistic period. All right, so I'm going to stop here. We're going to continue with the Hellenistic period. Um, we have a few more works to go look at. Well, maybe I'll continue. Nah, I'm going to stop. <laughs> There's a lot we have to go through. So, um, we're getting, we're sort of touching on the Hellenistic period. Um, so, part seven will be probably our last um, segment. I know it's been a long, a lot of, um, um, parts, um, but that will be their last um, section of the subunit of Greek art, so stay tuned. <laughs>